And so for the first company, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Saitori. Uh, Saitori is developing cell-based therapies from adipose tissue uh, with its lead product known as uh, Solution, a device that extracts and concentrates adipose-derived stem cells. So when you, when you think of Saitori, think of the movie, you know, Field of Dreams. And when you think of Field of Dreams, you remember that quote, uh, if they build it, if you build it, they will come. Uh, Saitori has went ahead and built it. And uh, we want to find out if everybody, investors as well as patients, are coming. Here to tell us a little bit about the company is Mark Hetrick, president of Saitori. So a little bit earlier, um, presumably some of you were in the audience uh, when we discussed cardiovascular therapy, uh, we talked very specifically about uh, the differentiation of, of our technology in the cardiovascular space. That differentiation uh, goes into many areas, and I want to just re-highlight that, that core element of differentiation one more time, and that is... We're cell therapy, but we're regulated as a device. In other words, we never put the cells on the market from a regulatory perspective. We put the, we put the tools on the market and then train the doctors and hospitals and so forth in how to use it. So let me just go into a little bit more detail as to how that works. So if you look up to the screen, you'll see the slide. It's a relatively straightforward process. The patient has a small fat harvest, sort of like a liposuction, except you don't really care about how they look so much. You extract the fat, 100 cc's, can be more, can be less, but call it about 100 cc's. That goes into a system. The system you see here is the one we use for our clinical trials here in the U.S. for, uh, for, just for uh, uh, chronic heart failure. Uh, it has multiple softwares, multiple languages. You put the fat tissue in, hit a button, and then automatically uh, the cells are processed, the fat's removed, the lipid's removed, the toxic elements are removed, the matrix are, is removed, and then roughly an hour, uh, maybe an hour and 20 minutes at bigger volumes, maybe a little less at smaller volumes, volumes, you end up with a syringe of the patient's own cells. That's that mixture of cells that I showed you before, and that can be made safe enough from an embolic and thrombogenic perspective to put down the coronary artery immediately after a heart attack, or you can, by virtue of changing the software and the additives, create a different output that can be used for other indications. So the, the box is the product, but what get, gets used on the patients are the cells. So that's, that's how we're different. Well, how are we the same? So we're like any other company that we have R&D group, we have a large basic science group. We also have a device development group, a machine shop. We're vertically integrated, which is expensive, but it's how you move quickly. We have a regulatory group, clinical group, and we actually have a commercial group. We actually have about 20 people in Japan, which is our biggest market right now. That's the same, but there's a nuance of this model that's important for what I want to talk to you about today, and that's these investigator-initiated studies that we're uh, promulgating around the world. So, because we're a device, because we're, we can get that on the market by a, a relatively straightforward means by showing safety, we can get that into the market, and there are customers that are willing to pay for that to do clinical studies. So we have governments, hospitals, individual investigators that are paying for that technology so they can investigate uh, a variety of difficult clinical problems around the world. And so that's a unique model, and it's different than other companies who have maybe more a pharmaceutical model that it's maybe more binary in terms of their product and their regulatory approval and their path to market and so forth. So that's a unique aspect of our business model, and I just want to give you a little bit of an insight as to the leverage that that provides the company and how we bring this technology to market and identify new potential areas so that, as Ren said, they will come. So here's just a case study, a uh, case in point, how we started with a device and women that had breast cancer, and we ended up with a $100 million contract with the U.S. government in case there's a nuclear bomb that explodes in a big city. So we developed our first generation of the technology, which wasn't so automated. Uh, we were able to get that approved through, a five through the uh, CE marking process in Europe, 
as a, as a processor for stem cells from adipose tissue. And based on that approval, uh, a doctor in Japan was interested in using the technology, imported it under a doctor's prescription, brought it into his hospital, operated on 20 patients that had breast cancer, uh, lumpectomy, a relatively large lumpectomy defect, and radiation, of which there's really no good uh, reconstruction for, frankly. Can't use implants and, and so forth. And from that data, it led to a larger 70 patient more of a pivotal study in Europe, and ultimately claims in Europe for breast cancer reconstruction, which we have. But what we found in that breast cancer reconstruction effort was that these cells are very good at reversing the ischemia and the radiation effects after cancer treatment, which largely most breast cancers in the U.S., about 70 percent, are treated with lumpectomy and radiation, not with mastectomy. And so based on that data, uh, both the clinical data and supportive preclinical data, we went to the U.S. government and began to investigate ways that we could solve one of the key uh, problems at HHS and BARDA, which is authority within HHS that's been um, asked to develop treatments for, uh, for the worst case scenarios for nuclear weapons. And so based on that discussion, our, our ability to prove radiation injury um, that was really the linchpin in getting that government contract. Also, that the change that we saw in patients with ischemia with radiation is similar to the ischemia you see in cardiovascular disease after multiple heart attacks. And that data became relevant in our, our, our portfolio submitted to the FDA to get approval ultimately for our U.S. Uh, cardiovascular ischemia study. It's also driving sales around the world, uh, small uh, but some. And then finally, it's generating interest in other indications, such as wound healing, uh, uh, patients that have incontinence, uh, scarred urethra after radical prostatectomy, and we have the ability to restore continence in that patient, it, patients, at least it looks like in early studies. So from that one breast study, a lot of things happen. I think that's a real leverage point within our technology. And this is just a, um, a slide that shows how this uh, initial $5 million uh, government contract sponsored research could lead ultimately to approximately $100 million in development money and then a contract with the government to acquire the technology and place it around the, the country in case uh, there's a, uh, a radiation and a, a burn event uh, related to a nuclear bomb. So you kind of add this, add this all up, where does this put us. And this slide shows uh, uh, the, the location and the nature of Saitori's current clinical programs. Now, we're not funding all this. In fact, only two of these 43 studies are Saitori sponsored studies, are two cardi cardiovascular studies, one in the U.S. and one in Europe. The other 41 represent a variety of indications around the world, some of which are sponsored by governments. Uh, BARDA, some uh, MHLW, uh, the French government, some are sponsored by hospitals, and it represents a relatively diverse group of, of indications. And we have the ability to work with these investigators to uh, allow them, encourage them, and help them raise funding to bring that technology through uh, the clinical pipeline, or we have the opportunity then to bring that in-house and put the full weight of our clinical program behind that to bring that to market and ultimately get reimbursement. So it's been a tremendous advantage for us on the commercial side, on the clinical exploration side, and developing new potential avenues so that, as Ren said, that patients will, will ultimately come and the doctors. So with that, thank you very much, and I think we have time for Q&A. Come on down. So maybe just to open it up um, a little bit, you know, you, you have a unique business model in that here you are, you're out planting seeds, if you will, um, in the hands of investigators, and depending on what sort of results you're getting, um, you know, you decide which ones you want to harvest, you know, bring in house and, and, and let go. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us a little bit about the, the uh, call it the quality of the data, the importance of the data um, in terms of partners um, and in terms of reimbursement? Uh, and, and next steps going forward? So the, the, the number one concern when we consider one of these studies is safety. So we're trying to develop a brand in the market. We're trying to, to help lead the market from a cell therapy perspective. And building and growing a, a brand and being trusted in the market is critical. So one thing you can't afford is to have uh, 
a physician take your technology and misuse it or use it in the wrong group of patients. So we actually do a lot of work up front to vet the physician, to vet the study, uh, to look at the background papers, and to make sure what they want to do is solid. And so that's, that's kind of the, the, um, the first check. And then the question is, where do they want to go from an efficacy clinical perspective? So in some cases, for example, in, in Japan with, with uh, incontinence, the physician was relatively clear. I want to do a pilot study. I want, to, I want to prove to our satisfaction that this can work for a difficult group of patients that have incontinence. And if it works, there's a pathway through the Japanese government to get advanced medical clearance, which is a, maybe more like 60 patients, uh, that can ultimately lead to um, claims and reimbursement, which are paired in Japan. So that's, that's, a, that's an ideal situation. And we are involved all along the way to, to help drive that process. But ultimately, the process is driven by the physician. On the other hand, um, we have very small studies going on with individual investigators, maybe a private practice, who are looking at a very narrow indication in uh, breast disease, tub tubular breast deformity, congenital disease, and so forth, that are really fall more in the c compassionate use, sort of, not from a regulatory perspective, but from a clinical perspective. And we know that's never likely to, to go somewhere, but it may involve either uh, a way we can you know, help a group of patients that we couldn't otherwise help, or um, maybe it can uh, provide a sales opportunity or so forth. And, and when we, just going along that line regarding partners, how do partners yeah. view this, um, you know, these data? And uh, I think you mentioned you were able to parlay some of this data into a BARDA contract. Can you, can you take us through how, maybe a little bit more detail, how you were able to do that? So I think, um, from a, what's the perspective of current partners right now? I think larger pharmaceutical medical device companies are, are generally speaking more wait and see. They'd like to see the revenue and then come in later rather than come in earlier. That's what we see. Um, we were able to bring Olympus to the table, a partnership that was really geared around the, the device and the manufacturer. Um, we were able to uh, develop a nascent partnership with a large pharmaceutical partner, Stellas. Um, by virtue of our Japanese operation, and they're interested more long term in helping clinic, but it's that's that's moving forward slowly. So I think from a large partnership perspective, uh, I think more mature data, phase, late phase two, phase three, is probably what's needed. However, there are groups that have a particular motivation to get a deal done, like the U.S. government. They have a very peculiar circumstance where. Uh, they can't wait for phase three data and approval and reimbursement. In fact, they don't need to. Uh, in fact, they can acquire this technology before there's FDA approval because it's a national need. So they ha they're driven by a different motivation. So from a partnering perspective, I think we've tried to be flexible to, to not just think about Medtronic, but think about you know, other partners who might be interested by, in partnering at this earlier stage with some of this investigator-initiated data, which... I think we've shown that can convince very skeptical parties like the U.S. government that they should align with us. And are, are you evaluating other, you know, parties like the U.S. government at, at, at this current time? So there's, I think, given what's going on around the world in, in this particular area of preparedness uh, and the concerns, I think the Fukushima disaster, um, I think there are the follow-on opportunities related to this, and that's an area of exploration. Uh, but uh, there are also... Uh, there are also opportunities with our non-radiation-related indications, urology, uh, renal, cardiac, so forth, that, that might be interesting for a partner as well. We are exploring those actively. So I guess just for the other companies in the audience and, and investors, um, and in the last minute that we have, um, how, does, you know, the, the, how do the physicians pay for uh, you know, this kind of Pay to, is it a pay-to-play uh, uh, type of model, or how are you giving away these devices to these physicians just for the investigator-sponsored trials? How does that work? It's, uh, it, it can be varied. Anyway, from we uh, will loan the system, and we will provide the consumables free of charge, which is unusual. Uh, more likely, it is that they buy the system or lease it, and then they buy the consumables, and we get them up and running. And it really depends on, uh, you know, our, our internal process as to the importance of that study and or that physician in our overall business strategy. Um, and then um, 
at some point we might be very uninterested in something, uh, but green light it. But then we might become, after we see uh, you know, 15 patients uh, with severe incontinence that are remarkably better, um, we might say, you know what, we're really interested in this, and we might pull that in and take it forward, or we might uh, up our support for that particular investigator because we think it's of strategic importance. So, so basically, investigators get to play and you get paid. That's the We that's get the paid model. In, in many cases, yeah. Terrific. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much for Thank your time. You. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks.